In this tutorial, we'll be talking about the basic operation of the camera, including all of the buttons and controls. We'll talk about exposure, which deals with your image brightness, focus, ISO, white balance, what all these symbols and icons mean, and how to navigate through the camera. This video is brought to you by Maven Magnetic Photography and Videography Filters. When you are ready to get a set of ND filters and polarizers, that link is in the description. If you are a beginner, you are in the right place, and I would say watch this video from start to finish. If you are a more advanced photographer or you're coming back to re-review this lesson, take advantage of our table of contents. We've spent a lot of time putting this together, and the way it works is if you hit Command F or Control F, type in the topic that you're interested in, hit return. It should highlight the lesson with a time code that you can click on, and it'll jump you to that lesson so you can use it to jump around and learn things or refresh the things you want to learn. Now, if you are a beginning photographer, I have to give you a word of warning. This video will cover the operation of the camera only. It is not enough for you to become a consistently great photographer. There's a ton of other things that you will need to know. For example, the basics of photography. When would you want one shutter speed over another? How does your aperture affect your depth of field? What are the drawbacks of ISO? And then there's things like lighting, in composition. Then we talk about the advanced features. The cameras today are far more advanced than when I got started in 2003. I can always remember the frustration I had when I was learning photography that I wanted to take my camera and throw it into a wall because I was so frustrated. I knew in my mind what I wanted to do, but I couldn't do it with the camera. And that is the idea of the crash course. It is a paid course. This is like my interview. I'm, I'm showing you if you like the way that I teach. And if you do, I would highly recommend it. There's probably no faster, easier way to take advantage and learn how to really use your camera. It's designed to take a pure beginner and get them up to an advanced shooting level in about six or seven hours. I've had many many students over the years who cut out that learning curve. Now, the reason I tell you all this is that if we hear enough from our students asking for me to make a crash course, we will do it. They take a lot of work, about four to six weeks of production time to put that together. But basically we do it on demand. So if enough people ask, put it together. And when it's ready, we will email you. We also have a Facebook group where you can share your images, ask questions, get feedback, things of that nature put that link in the description as well. We have a ton of information to cover, so let's get started. Before we get started, I just wanted to tell a quick story about Fuji cameras. They are greatly underestimated. They are fantastic cameras. I was on a safari last November, had an extra Fuji, handed it to a pure beginner who had, doesn't really, had never really shot before, paired him up with a 100 to 400 lens, and over the next period of the next week, this guy's pure beginner shot amazing <laughs> images on a safari, I think he shot like five or 6,000 and his pictures were awesome. So if this is your first Fuji, be patient with yourself. It is going to be well worth it. Fuji makes awesome camera systems. Their lenses are amazing. I wanted to talk about some of the battery and the setup, you know, with a shoe and a tripod, some lens stuff before we get into the controls of the camera. Also, highly recommend that you have your camera in your hands as you're watching this video. You can pause the video and follow along to see what I'm doing. First things first, let's get a fresh battery into the camera. I always, uh, I have a Sharpie marker, one of these metallic ones, and I just write the name of the camera and which battery number it is. It allows me to keep track of whether the batteries are getting old or they're not recharging really well. You'll notice that there's some pins on the front of this and those are gonna go towards the grip right here. To release it, we're gonna flip up on this little orange switch and it'll come out. On the bottom of the camera, you're going to also notice that we have this hole in the bottom. This is where our shoe is going to go to allow us to mount it onto a tripod. This particular shoe I'm a big fan of because it has this lip that allows me to drop it into the tripod really quickly. So I can drop it in and take it out. It's made by Bogan Monfrotto. Love it. Been using it my whole career since I first got started, but watch how easy it is to drop this in and lock it. So now I'm locked on a tripod. So I zoomed out a little bit because I want you to see what's going on here. This is called a ball head. And if you have a good tripod, it will allow you to interchange the tripod heads. So a ball tripod is great if you're a landscape photographer and you need to 
orient the camera in different positions. So I can take this and move it around and then I can lock this. This is an older version of the ball head by Bogan Ronfrado. They have newer versions that are even better. And I have the carbon fiber legs. These will cost four or $500 to get started. But any good tripod, if you've invested this much money into a camera, you should be investing your money into a good tripod. Avoid those ones that you see at Walmart. The way this particular one is set up, if I want to, there's a lock on the back so I can just release it and then drop it in and it locks again. This is why I like it so much. So I wanna show you some memory cards and this is the brand that I typically shoot with. Sometimes I, I can go with Lexars, but I'm almost always shooting SanDisk Extreme Pros. Now these memory cards, they look the same, but they are not the same. So when you go shopping for them, keep your eye out for this difference right here. There's a little two right there and there's a little one right here. This is a UHS-2 memory card, and this is a UHS-1 memory card. So you're probably wondering what that means. If we flip them around, UHS-1 memory card has one row of pins. UHS-2 memory card has two rows of pins. So the UHS-2s can write much faster, and if you're doing sport shooting, birds in the flight, wildlife, and you're going to be doing high bursts, you're going to definitely want to get a UHS-2 memory card with a fast write speed. The numbers you see here are the maximum read speed. So it doesn't really tell, but sometimes on the packaging and in the advertising, it will tell you how fast they, they write. Over the life of your camera, when you have a fast set of memory cards, they're going to pay dividends over and over and over again. If you're, if you're using a slower memory card, what you'll experience is that as you're shooting rapid shots, the buffer will fill up and your camera will stop or it takes longer to move your images you know, off your memory card to your computer if, if they're reading slow. Sometimes I'll get emails from students who they'll find a memory card and they'll just put it in their camera and they're wondering why they, their video stops recording after two seconds. So speaking of video, the other thing I want you to look for is this guy right here. It's like a little U and it has the number three in it and they're in both of them. Class U3 memory cards is the sustained write speed for 4K video. So if you're doing anything in 4K video, you have to have at least the U3 or faster. You can get some fantastic deals on the class one memory cards. I think last time I checked, you can get a 128 gigabyte card for under $30. Whereas this card might cost well over $100. So obviously it is going to cost more to go with UHS twos, but again, I think it's well worth it. And you'll notice here on the side of the camera, that these icons, they show a little cut corner, which deals with this guy. So we're gonna put the fast one into, oh, sorry, fast one into slot one until it clicks. We're gonna put the UHS one card into slot two until it clicks. When you want to remove them, push them in and, and then they'll pop out. When you're ready to move them, push them down until you hear a click and you can slide it out, push it in until you hear a click, push it in, close the door. Here's my famous uh, Sharpie marker and You'll notice that we have this open mark that when we rotate the, the, the body cap over, it comes off and you'll see this red dot underneath it. And so what I like to do is just mark the place with this Sharpie so I know where to put it on and I'll have to fumble with this each time because otherwise it's, it's kind of hard to see where we're supposed to put this on. So I put it on there. And what you'll notice is that we also have this little dot on the back of our lens caps and I also put a marker there, I have a kit lens here, I'm talking about it in just a minute. So I just put that just there, just makes my life easier. So when I pull this off, you can see that this notch matches up with the red dot on the lens. I'm gonna take both of these off. Red dot goes to red dot. I'm gonna line those up, up and we're gonna rotate it until we hear the click. To release the lens, you'll notice we have this little button right here. It's gonna be great to get into the habit to feel that with your ring finger, push it all the way down and now you can rotate the lens off. As you grip the camera, that should become second nature. Something I need to say about the physical size of the sensor is that this is a crop sensor. It's smaller than a full frame sensor, like a 35 millimeter sensor. And because it's slightly smaller, there is going to be a magnification factor on the lens we are using. And that magnification factor is 1.5. So the way the math works is if I put a 50 millimeter lens on my Fuji X-T5, it would really behave as a 75 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. Why? Because 50 millimeters times 1.5 is 75 millimeters. So that's something you should always keep in mind when you're purchasing lenses or you're planning to use lenses for specific shoots. 
This is probably one of the greatest kit lenses ever made in the history of cameras. It is the Fuji 18 to 55. I also use a, a Fuji 16 to 55 2.8. The kit lens, every Fuji owner should have it because it's small, it's compact, it, it is sharp, and you can even get used ones on eBay. I have seen them for less than $200 all day long, which is a phenomenal value in terms of a lens. So when we apply the crop factor to the kit lens, the 18 to 55, it's really about a 27 millimeter to 82.5 millimeter, which is a great mid-range zoom, general purpose. You can get a lot done with this lens. Take that, put it back on, rotate it until we hear it click. Many of you know that I, I have my own filter line for lenses. So ND filters, circular polarizers. And the way you can find your thread size for your lens is simply to take a look under your lens cap. Most lens caps will do this. It's a little circle with a line through it and it says 58. So I know this is a 58 millimeter lens thread. When you're ready to get your ND filters and your CPL filters, check out Maven filters. I wanna take you on a tour of what all these external buttons and controls are. Fuji can be pretty intimidating because there's so many dials, but Fuji is also very unique in, in how they have their camera settings set up. Starting off, obviously, here's the power switch. We turn the camera on and off by rotating this little switch to it so it points to on. You can see the shutter button, very important to take your finger while this is turned on and to feel this spongy resistance as you push it halfway down, and then when you push it down all the way. When you engage the shutter button halfway, you are engaging the camera's focusing systems if you're using autofocus. So this should become second nature that you can focus with a halfway shutter button depression, and then when you're ready to take the shot, you push it all the way down. That should become muscle memory. So you should be able to feel this. There are some different techniques using back button focus, but this is how most modern cameras operate with this halfway shutter button depression engaging our auto focusing systems. Something I wanna point out that we'll see when we talk about exposure is we have a dial here for shutter speed and we have a dial here for ISO. And you're going to notice that on most lenses, as well as these dials, you're going to see a, a little, it's almost like an orange reddish A. That stands for automatic, and we're gonna come back to that in a moment, but all of these other settings on here have to do with specific settings of shutter speed. These are fractions, one eight thousandth of a second, one four thousandth of a second. So you can come in and dial in the precise shutter speed that you want. You will notice that this number here, 250, has an X by it. That is our camera's sync speed when we're dealing with flash, and we also have whole numbers. As these numbers get smaller and smaller, it's actually becoming a longer and longer shutter speed. Eighth, quarter, half, one second. T stands for time value that we would enter in with a different control, and then B is bulb, which means the exposure will happen for as long as we have the shutter button pushed down. We have our ISO controls. We have something over here that controls exposure compensation. We'll be talking about that later. This button here is a customizable function button. By default, it should deal with face or eye detection. Very useful, and I usually leave it on that. This guy here is our hot shoe. This deals with putting a strobe unit onto our camera. I recommend a Godox TT685F because it's $120, and it has most of the pro features that you'll find in a strobe system, and I demonstrate that on the crash course. Just off to the left of the hot shoe, there's a little dial that we pull, pull this out, we can rotate it. This is the diopter adjustment. The diopter adjustment allows us to adjust the focus of the EVF for corrective eyewear. So if you wear glasses or if you wear contacts and you're looking through the EVF and it's blurry, this is how you're going to change the focus. Off to the right of the EVF, we have a view mode button. When we push this, this will toggle which of our monitors is on and how they function. There's different ways to use this depending if you're using a gimbal or maybe you just wanna turn off your back monitor altogether. So you toggle through that and I definitely recommend playing with that button to see how it controls your monitors. It's a little hard to see here, but we have two switches on the front of the camera. This one deals with turning the camera from a stills to a video mode and this is our drive mode selector, whether we're dealing with a single shot 
or multiple frames or a timer. Something else I need to point out is that you'll notice these posts, if you push on them, they go into the camera body and it locks the dial so we can't turn them. Push it again, it unlocks the dial and then we can rotate it freely. Very nice feature to prevent bumping. You know, if, if you're doing something a little bit more like you're, you know, maybe hiking or, you know, walking around, moving around with a crowd of people and you don't want these bumped, that's when you would use those. Let's talk about some of the things that we're seeing on the front part of the camera, on the right side as you hold it. This guy right here, there's a little wheel that rotates to the left and right. I like to call this the primary selector because our number one finger is on the primary selector. One, primary. We'll come back to that in the exposure lesson. Right here, we have this little lamp that's going to come on. It's a, an auto-focused assist lamp in dark situations. It will also work as a timing light if you're using a timer mode. Just below that, it's kind of hard to see, we have another customizable function button, which we can set up in our deep menu. We've already pointed out this guy right here, which is the lens release. And I'm gonna turn the camera over this way. Let's talk about some of these guys. This little guy right here, be careful with this cap. Definitely leave this on tight because I've lost multiple of these little guys, these little caps. If you unscrew it, you're going to see a PC sync terminal. This is where you would attach a strobe unit cable to your camera. So when you fired the camera, the strobe would fire. Again, when you put this cap on, make sure you put it on tight. I'm sure somebody's making a fortune off replacement caps. This guy right here is our auto focusing mode. M stands for manual, continuous, and single. We'll be talking about that later in the focusing lesson. When we take a look at the side of the lens, not all Fuji lenses have this, but most of them, especially if they're using Im image stabilization, will have a stabilization switch that you can turn on or off iOS optical image stabilization. And here is the aperture switch. So if we have the aperture switch to A, the camera is going to be helping us with the aperture. If we have it turned to the icon of the lens blades, then we would be dialing the aperture in directly. Talk about what's under these gaskets here. At the very top, we have our microphone jack. This is very important if you're using your camera for video. There's built-in microphones to the camera, but they're not really great. So I always recommend using an external microphone and the microphones you use will change a little bit depending on whether it's in a general shooting environment or whether you're doing interviews, but this is where you would plug your microphone in. Below that, we have a remote terminal. Below that, we have our USB-C, which does a number of things. You should find a USB-C cable to charge your camera. There's no battery charger that comes with the camera. So the way Fuji wants you to charge your batteries is to put, keep your battery in your camera and then to plug your power cord that came with your camera through that USB-C cable to charge the battery through here. And you should have also received a little packet like this. It's USB-C to headphone jack. This will allow us to listen with headphones while we're recording video. So you don't wanna lose this guy. And this will allow us to monitor for video recording. And then we have our small HDMI port. Coming back to this, my recommendation is Fuji does make a dual battery charger. I think it's like 70 bucks, it's worth every penny. I don't believe in charging the, the batteries in camera unless it's like an emergency because when I'm charging in camera, uh, you know, I could be using the camera for shooting. So I just get that extra charger, extra batteries, and I just charge them on that charger. When we take a look at the back of the camera, I want to show you the stills to video mode switch by switching this front lever. We can jump between a still shooting mode and our video shooting mode. Very important to keep in mind. Over here, we have our drive mode switch. So we move the switch in the front of the camera. We're talking about some of these different modes and what they do a little later. Obviously we have our play button, turn the camera on. And when we play an image back, you should keep in mind that when we pinch out, we're zooming in, touch and drag to move around, just like your smartphone would. As we pinch in, should be zooming out so you can see multiple images. Should be able to double tap. If you press the garbage icon, we can delete the frame. Selected frames are all the frames. So just wanted to delete one of them, it's right there. I'm gonna make this a little easier to see what we're doing here. This guy right here, AF on, is our back button focus. So when you push this, this will engage our focusing systems and very useful for sports shooters. There's different ways to customize it, but for now just think this is a second way to engage focusing. We have our Q menu button. We have our auto exposure lock button. 
We have our mini joystick that allows us to change the position of the focusing square. We have our directional pad, and this can be used in different modes depending on whether we're shooting, navigating the menus, looking around. Here we have our Bluetooth button. It also has a display or back button. If we're ever in a, a menu mode, a Q mode, anything like that, tap the shutter button, it'll bring you back to shooting. The Q menu, press this button, and it will open up this quick menu. This guy here, the back wheel, I like to refer to this as the secondary selector. Why? Because we're using our thumb, so it's number one, thumb's number two. Talk about this in the exposure lesson. Something else I need to point out, and this can be very confusing if you bump the view and mode button on the side of the EVF. If you bump this and you don't know that you've bumped it, it can create a lot of problems. Something that you'll notice is that just below the EVF, there's this little switch. It's like an infrared switch just below there. And as I pass the pencil right in front of that, you'll see that the back monitor is turning off. This is a battery saving feature. And the idea is that when we lift the camera to our face, it saves battery power from going to the back monitor. And there's different ways to customize this depending on whether or not you push this view mode button. So if I push this view mode button, you should do this a couple times so you become familiar with it. If you push it once and it says LCD only, what that means is the switch is no longer active. No matter what I do, we're just looking at this back monitor. If I push it again, this is where the problems come if you don't know that you've hit it because now this is EVF only. And you'll be thinking, oh, my, my back monitor is not working or maybe my battery isn't charged. It's also possible you just bumped your, your view mode button. If you push it again, nothing happens. And the reason is now this is EVF plus the eye sensor, which means that this will only turn on when you raise the camera to your face. So as you toggle that, sensor, then the EVF will turn on. And there's even a third mode to this. I'm going to push this again. This is eye sensor with LCD display, which basically means that you'll be looking through the EVF and then you can shoot. And when you stop shooting, the LCD monitor will kick on. If you push it again, now we're back to our regular eye sensor mode. So there's several different modes in there. Just keep this in mind that if you handle this or bump it, you might think you're out of battery power or maybe you've just toggled this on. Oh, one other thing I didn't point out is that we have a little lamp here that will turn on as we focus. You can see it's turning green as we're focusing. As we shoot, it'll turn like an orange when it's writing to the memory card. In addition to this, we also have the display button that in a shooting mode that as you push this display button, it will toggle the different types of information shooting on our LCD. This also applies to when we're playing back an image. So if I play back this image that's underexposed, can't really see it. But if I push the display or the information button, we can get our histograms, we can get our EXIF data. We can see the different kinds of information we had when we were shooting. And again, if I want to jump back into a shooting mode, I tap the shutter button and I, I can get back in it. And I've turned the exposure down just to, to make some of these symbols and icons easier to see. Let's talk about some of these icons and numbers and symbols. And I'm going to do something in the menu just to make it a little bit easier to see. So I'm pressing my menu button, coming to this wrench icon, going to screen setup. And then on page three out of four, large indicators mode LCD. I'm going to turn this to on just to make it easier to see for this particular demonstration because we're going to be talking about these numbers here on the bottom, make these a little easier for you to see. There are three critical pieces of information that you should always kind of keep your eye on as a photographer. They are your shutter speed, which in this case, these are fractions. So when you see 50, that really means 1 50th of a second. Anytime you see a number with an F in front of that, that is talking about the aperture. And the aperture deals with how wide or how narrow the lens opening is. If it's a very, very wide opening, it's going to, going to let in a lot of light. And if it's a very, very small opening, it's going to let in a very small amount of light. Your shutter speed and your aperture are the primary settings that control how much light is coming into the camera. And therefore, they are the most critical of all the camera settings when we're talking about exposure. Now, there's a third part of this referred to as ISO. ISO is the sensitivity of our sensor. Back in the days of film cameras, we could buy more sensitive film. It was more sensitive to light or less sensitive to light. And the lower the number, the less sensitive it is. And the higher the number, 
the more sensitive it is. Something else that you'll notice is we also get these little, like a half moon shaped icon, and that is telling us which control will change that setting. So when you see a bottom half of a moon icon, that's telling us it's the secondary control wheel. If we see a half circle on the top, that's talking about the front control wheel, where it's set to ISO because I have it set to C over here. Something to keep in mind that when we're talking about F stops or the aperture opening is that when the number gets higher, the opening gets smaller. So if I go to something like F22, I'm not letting in that much light, very little amount of light. And as that number gets smaller, I'm letting in more and more light, it's becoming wider and wider. And as a photographer, you will constantly be changing your aperture and your shutter speed depending on the types of shooting that you're doing. And then you'll tweak your ISO depending on what you need. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Looking at some of these other icons that I want you to become familiar with, just to give them names. Over here, anytime you see this symbol with a plus minus sign in a box, that is an exposure symbol. Exposure is brightness. So anytime you see this, this is dealing with the overall brightness of what we're seeing. And this is the exposure compensation bracket. We'll be talking about it a little bit later. Below that, we have our metering mode indicator. Right here, we have our drive mode indicator. This is telling us what the camera does after we push a shutter button down all the way. And H with multiple frames is a high speed burst. Over here on the top, this tells us what our video recording resolution and frame rate is. So we're at 4K, 29.97 frames per second, or about 30 frames per second. We'll talk about video settings a little later. Hours, minutes, and seconds deal with how much space we have on our current memory card. I have some other files on here, so I only have about 35 minutes left. This one and two deal with which memory card we are currently recording to. And this deals with the number of shots we have remaining on our current camera settings. This is stills. So this is video and this is stills. And then over here, LF deals with the size of our stills. So this is a large image at the full 40 megapixel resolution. Fine deals with the amount of compression. When we see this finger and it says shot, but when you touch on the screen, it will focus and take the picture. If we go to AF, it is now focusing on this spot. Finger AF also depends on what focusing mode we're on. If we're on a single focusing mode, it will focus on here and stay locked. If we are on a continuous focusing mode, it will continue to focus over and over and over again until we turn this off. If we go to area, this is simply allowing us to move where our focusing square is using the touch monitor. And if we go all the way to off now, it's not working. So we have different ways to interact with the touch monitor in order to control this. If we're in manual focus and we use this, it will briefly engage the focusing system. It's kind of a nice tool. Here we have our film simulations and our dynamic range. Fuji cameras are known for film simulations and we can access them by pushing to the left on our directional pad and you can scroll through them. In the beginning, I would say just stick with standard for now, but they have a lot of great looks built into the camera. They are great to play around with. And on that note, you'll notice that we can push in different directions to access things like our metering mode. We'll be talking about that later. Push to the right. We can change our white balance. We'll be talking about that later. Push down to change the performance boost of our camera. A higher performance boost is going to use more energy. And there's also a lower performance boost if we keep going down economy just depending on what you're doing and how many batteries you have. If we continue to press the display button, you'll see that some of these icons will disappear. If you want less information, pushing it again, we can come into the black screen. We also get a little preview of our quick menu down here, just depending on what you're looking for. And then we're back to our main screen. Let's talk about the queue or the quick menu. When you push this, this is going to open a sub menu. And the idea here is that we have a screen where we can access a lot of settings if you don't want to go into the deep menu or maybe you forgot where it is. We can set this up according how we want it. We can navigate through the queue menu by using the joystick. We can use the control wheels to change a setting once we're in there. I'm using the front control wheel to navigate. I can use the directional pad to go up and down. I can press the OK button 
to jump back out of it. But the idea here is that you're going to scroll over certain things. You can even touch directly and you're going to change the settings. Depending on what the setting is that we're, we've selected, we can change them according to the options they have. In this case, this top left hand is telling us the mode that we are shooting in. If I was to rotate this over to A, and hit Q again, you'll see it should be in the aperture priority mode. So we don't really change this in the menu. If I start scrolling through these, we have our auto focusing clusters. We'll be talking about that in the focusing lesson, our dynamic range. We have our white balance we'll be talking about, film simulations. We have our image quality, which if we rotate the back wheel, we can go from fine to normal. We can select raw. raw when you see raw in F or N, it, that means we are shooting both raw format with JPEG format. So fine is less compressed, normal is more compressed. If we just have normal and fine, those are JPEGs. And if we just have raw, now we're shooting in raw. Something I want to point out real quick is that depending on the quality setting that you have, this is going to change the number of shots remaining. So if I'm shooting raw with large, for example, I put a new memory card in there, I have 1,237 images I can record. But if I hit my Q button and I come in and I change this just to be, let's say, normal, come back out, now I can shoot 7,925. So keep this in mind that the quality that you're recording in, as well as the size and the compression, all of those things will come into play in terms of how many images you can take. So if you're shooting a sporting event and you need space for thousands of images, that's really important. If it's a professional shoot, you know, for half an hour, we're probably not going to take more than a few hundred shots, you know, maximum. So that's something to keep in mind as you select your qualities to keep an eye on how many shots remaining you can get out of it. As we continue to scroll over, image size, if we wanted to change the size that we're shooting in and the dimensions. So three by two large, we have a large 16 by nine. Obviously this is going to change the megapixels. We have a one by one, we have a four by three, five, five by four. And then we can get into the medium and those same ratios and then small and similar ratios. I tell all my students in the beginning, just shoot on large three by two because that's going to give you the full resolution. And if you need to size down or crop, you will have more real estate to deal with. It's a lot easier to take a large image and go small than to take a, a small image and make it larger. We have our ISO noise reduction. We're talking about ISO in just a moment. We have our highlight tone adjustment, our shadow tone adjustment. Most of these deal with JPEGs where we can tweak the settings as the camera is converting that raw data into a JPEG. We have our color, which is also known as saturation. We have our image sharpness, LCD brightness. Here we have our subject detection. So we can select an animal, bird, automobile, motorcycle, airplane, train, or we can turn it off. Now we have face and eye detection. Obviously this is for humans. I use the function one button on the top of the camera. If you wanted to change it from back here, we could. We have face detection on, eye detection off. Eye detection auto, where it's going to pick which of the eyeballs it wants. Then we have the right eye priority, left eye priority, and then we can turn it off. And we also have a timer. Something that's cool about this is that you can set it up the way you like it, and then you can push and hold the Q button down to create a new custom setting for it. Tap the shutter button, and then jump back out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, are most of the icons and symbols that you will see. Again, these three are the critical key ones on the bottom to constantly keep your eyes on. Before we jump into the exposure lesson, I wanted to demonstrate the importance of ISO and what it does. You're going to be relying on this a bit, and I want you to understand what's happening. I'm going to turn the exposure compensation down just a little bit so you can see what's going on. Here I'm, I'm shooting at a shutter speed of 1 60th of second, 2.8. With an ISO of 200, I'm going to take a picture and I'm going to take a look at it. Something that you're going to notice is that when I zoom in at ISO 200 and I'm looking at the blinds, we get this nice, straight, clean line. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my ISO up as high as it'll go. Let's go 12,800. This is, this, is, this is not even the highest. Take a picture. 
I'm going to zoom in again on this one that I just took and take a look to see what happened with that fine detailed blind edge. It's now become fuzzy and you'll notice there's a ton of grain in here. So this is the trade-off with ISO. The way ISO works is it simulates film to become more sensitive or less sensitive. When the number is higher, it is more sensitive, but we also get an introduction of grain. So there's always this balance of trying to figure out the highest <laughs> ISO that you can add without adding grain to your image. It's hard to give a rule of thumb because it depends on how much light you're shooting in, but typically 16, 3200, you're probably going to be okay in most cases. If you're in a low light situation, if it's dark enough, you're going to see grain even less than that, you know, at ISO 800. But to summarize as a rule of thumb, as we increase our ISO, we are boosting the signal coming into the camera, but we're also adding more grain, something to be aware of. Every photographer should know about that. Now we're going to start talking about exposure, which is really a fancy word for saying image brightness. So this lesson is about how do we change our image brightness in the different modes. Something that's unique to Fuji cameras is that we do not have a dedicated mode dial. On other camera systems like Canon and Nikon, you're going to see this, this dedicated mode dial that will allow them to go from a dummy mode to you know, something like shutter priority, aperture priority, or manual mode. And we don't have that dedicated mode dial on a Fuji camera because of how it's set up with the automatic settings, which is designated in this orange or it's a reddish A on each of the exposure controls. When I say exposure controls, it's really shutter speed and aperture, but you can also include ISO because ISO is going to give us that boost. All that said, we can still see which mode we are in. When we jump into the Q menu, you can see it up there. So Fuji still recognizes which mode we're in, but the easiest way for me to explain the technicality of this is to talk about aperture priority mode first. To get an aperture priority mode, what I want you to do is to set your ISO dial to C, meaning that we will dial in our ISO specifically. I want you to dial in your shutter speed dial to A, automatic, and then on your lens, I want this to be pointing to the aperture icon, not the A. So if it is set up correctly, you should see something like this on the bottom of your camera where our shutter speed is white, our F number is blue, and our ISO number is also blue. When you see a designated blue control down here on the bottom, Fuji is basically saying, this is what you can control. So how do we change our aperture and aperture priority mode? We will rotate the aperture control ring. Left and right, you can see 2.8, and as I rotate it clockwise, it's going all the way up to F22. Now something you're going to notice that as I change the aperture, the brightness of the image or the preview stays the same. How is this possible when we're changing the size of the aperture to become smaller and smaller? As I get into these higher f-stop numbers, f22 is a very, very small aperture. It's not letting in a lot of light, but the preview stays more or less consistent. Well, the answer is right here in the shutter speed. As we change the aperture, the camera is making adjustments to the shutter speed in order to maintain an even exposure. So the adjustments in aperture priority mode are that we control the aperture and the camera controls the shutter speed. Now there's another exercise that I want you to do. Hopefully you have your camera in your hand, set it to its widest aperture. And I also want you to take your hand and slowly move it in front of the camera like this. And you'll notice the shutter speed is also changing, even though we're not changing the aperture this time. So this is the secret of how aperture priority works is that when we control the amount of light coming into the camera, the camera will adjust the shutter speed to compensate for greater light or for not as much light. Something that surprises a lot of people is when I tell them I mostly shoot in aperture priority mode, probably like 80% of the time, including sports. And they say, why is that? And I say, well, because I can just come in and dial in my aperture and then I can sneak these peaks over here at my shutter speed. So if I'm outside on a sunny day and there's a lot of light and I'm shooting wide open, I know my shutter speeds are gonna be pretty fast. 
one one thousandth, one two thousandth, one four thousandth of a second, and then I will tweak and adjust my ISO as needed. My rule of thumb is that if I am short on time, sports shooting, even wedding, event photography, I'm usually on aperture priority because the camera can help me with a lot of that heavy lifting. If I have more time or if I'm shooting strobes and it's something a little bit more precise, then I will shoot in manual mode. So having said that, a few rules of thumb that you should know about your shutter speed is that as you're shooting an aperture priority, you should always be sneaking a peek over here. And there are two critical barriers that you should just memorize. The first is one sixtieth of a second. So if you're shooting handheld and you are shooting with a shutter speed less than one sixtieth of a second, probably going to be blurry, even with image stabilization, because we move, people move. And there's something about one sixtieth of a second that is right around where most people can hold still. If you're a pure beginner, I would even maybe say one one hundredth of a second, one one hundred twenty fifth of a second to get fast enough to not have to worry about motion blur when you're holding the camera. The second shutter speed you should be aware of is one five hundredth of a second if you are shooting sports. One five hundredth of a second is the shutter speed barrier that I set for sports shooting. And if you can shoot even faster, that would be better because you're going to need it to freeze the action. If we shoot sports with lower shutter speeds than one five hundredth of a second, there's a pretty good chance images are going to be blurry and you will not be happy with those keepers. So you're probably thinking, Michael, that's all good and great. How do we change the brightness of the image? What if I'm not happy with how, how dark it is and I want to make it brighter? There's a short answer to this and there's a long answer to this. The short answer is we make the images brighter or darker in aperture priority mode by rotating the exposure compensation dial, this guy right here. And you'll notice that this dial corresponds with this bar. So as you rotate this counterclockwise, you can see it going up. If we rotate it clockwise, it's going down. Make sure that tick mark is on zero and we're going to take a picture. Take a picture of something, anything. Inspect it. Okay, so it's a nice even exposure. If you want to make it brighter, rotate your exposure compensation dial to plus one and take a picture. And then plus two, take a picture, plus three, take a picture. Now we're going to go in the opposite direction. If we wanted to make it darker, we would go down on the scale, negative. Here's negative one. Here's negative two. And you can see that the screen is changing its brightness as you're controlling this dial. So that's the short answer is the exposure compensation wheel here in aperture priority mode, shutter priority mode, or even program mode, those three modes that we're going to talk about now, this will change image brightness. If we play back the images and we want to inspect these, we can zoom out. And you can see the differences in exposure as we're moving that dial around. We started here, we got a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter, negative one, negative two, and negative three EV. So you hear me say those numbers, plus one, minus one, plus three, minus three. Those numbers correspond to stop values over here on this exposure compensation bar. What is a stop? A stop is twice the amount of light as before. It's two times the amount of light. So anytime you hear one stop, it can, it can happen in different ways. It can happen with shutter speed, aperture, your ISO. Anytime you're talking about stops, we're talking about increasing the exposure value by two, or if we're going in the other direction, we're cutting it in half. And it can prove this to you mathematically. This is one of my favorite parts of these, these videos. Take a look at the shutter speed right here. One 320th of a second. Keep an eye on the shutter speed. When I rotate this to plus one, Look what's happening to the shutter speed. So now it's saying 1 160th of a second instead of 1 320th of a second. If you remember your math from school, if we take 1 320th of a second plus 1 320th of a second, that is 2 320ths of a second. And if we were to simplify 2 320ths of a second, we would get one one sixtieth of a second. So what this is telling us mathematically is we're taking two lengths of this shutter speed to create a longer shutter speed that is twice as long here. 
if we were to go from plus one to plus two, what do you think the shutter speed would be at plus two? Just work it out. One one hundred and sixtieth plus one one hundred and sixtieth is two one hundred and sixtieths, right? Simplified should be if you said one eighty, you're absolutely correct. And we can do it again. One eightieth plus one eightieth is two eightieths. Two eightieths simplified, one fortieth of a second. So the heart of the matter is that aperture priority mode. We dial in the aperture. The camera will make adjustments to the shutter speed. And if we change our exposure compensation wheel, we are giving the camera permission to cheat the shutter speed an additional amount to make it a little bit brighter or a little bit darker. Now, something else you'll notice is that we have two tick marks in between each of these numbers. And what this means is that every rotation of the dial, whether it's the exposure control wheel, whether it's the front or the rear dial, is going to change the setting by one third increments. So here's one third, here's two thirds, and here's a full stop. So what that means is that every time you rotate one of these dials three times, you have gone one stop, just a little piece of side information. When I shot weddings and events, I was almost always shooting at plus one third or plus two thirds, almost always, you know, it depends on the light and, and what metering setting you have. But I just wanted to try to get it right in camera. And that's something you should aim for is you want to try to avoid the, oh, I can fix this later. I can add, you know, I can do this in Lightroom and post. You want to get away from that kind of thinking and try to get it right in camera. You still may need to do something to it, but there's a saying garbage in, garbage out. If you have crappy images being recorded to your memory card and you have a crappy starting point, it's going to be a lot harder than if you got it really close in camera and made minor tweaks. And if you get good enough, you know, you, you may not have to do anything to the image after you've taken it, just depending on what you do. So we've talked about aperture priority. Let's talk about shutter priority. So in order to get to shutter priority, we have to switch our lens switch to A. And you'll notice the color changes there on the bottom of the screen. It goes from blue to white. And now I'm going to change the shutter speed from A here to T, time value. And you'll notice that now we have control of the shutter speed with the back control wheel and our ISO stays the same. So let's take a look at our aperture as we change our shutter speed. Changing the shutter speed with the rear control wheel, we can see that the aperture is changing. This is the opposite of what we just saw. So in shutter priority mode, we change the shutter speed, the camera adjusts the aperture to try to keep everything even. That's the gist of it. If we take our hand and cover the front of the lens, the camera is trying to open the aperture to let more light in to compensate for it. I don't really use shutter priority a lot, but I think it's, it's pretty good when you're just getting started to learn how the camera operates. So I wanna give you an example now in terms of let's pretend that you're going to a sporting event and you, you know that I told you, hey, you gotta shoot at one 500th of a second. So you're gonna say, okay, I'll just dial that in right here. Here's the one 500th. And something that you'll notice is that on program mode, aperture priority mode, and shutter priority mode is that we, when we get into really wacky settings, the camera will not give us that exposure preview. It, in manual, we can have it set up that way. But let's just take a picture here, see what we're dealing with. Always take a test picture if you have an important event. So we got one 500th of a second, F2.8 is in red, ISO 200, and when I play that image back, it's dark. So you, ha you have a problem here. And what's happening is the camera is saying that it cannot open the aperture wider than it is right here. This is the limit, 2.8 is the limit. And so when we're using this faster shutter speed, it's trying to compensate by opening up the aperture of the lens wider, but it's physically limited. You have a situation, shooting a sporting event, you wanna stay at that one 500th of a second, aperture is maxed out, what are you going to do? Think about it for just a minute. If you said bump up your ISO, you are absolutely correct. So let's watch what happens as we increase the ISO. Again, this half circle shape in the front is dealing with our ISO, rotating it, and there we go. You can see at around 3200, it goes from red to white. So the answer on this is in these situations where it's low light and using a faster shutter speed, maybe it's an indoor basketball event, you might have to bump up your ISO. You might have to accept some of this noise grain. Take a picture, play it back, and there it is. We have this even exposure. 
once we bump up that ISO. So the heart of the matter with shutter priority is that we dial in the shutter speed, the camera will make adjustments to the aperture. There's a good chance in low light situations, your aperture is going to get maxed out. And in those situations, you'll have to bump up your ISO. Something else you're going to notice about the, the mode dial is that as we rotate it to these lower numbers, one and two, we go from a fraction, here's one half of a second, and when we get to one, now we are seeing seconds. So we can dial that in on this dial, or we can also dial it in here. So as we rotate, 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 to longer shutter speeds, you, when you start to see those tick marks, now we're dealing with seconds, very long exposures. And we have the opposite problem, is it's going to be very bright and overexposed if we take a picture. Eventually, we'll get to 15 minutes. So the 15, so we can do a 15 minute exposure in shutter priority mode if we wanted to. Because we're on the topic of shutter speed, something that you'll notice on your mode dial is we have this B icon. B stands for bulb. In order for this feature to work, it doesn't really work in shutter priority mode. You'll see it's maxed out at 30 seconds. And basically, if you, if you shot here, it would be a 30 second exposure. When we flip our lens switch back to the icon, the aperture icon, we have control of it. Now we can see that it says bulb. The way bulb works is that if you push the shutter button down and hold it down, the exposure will continue. I believe it's up to 60 minutes until you release it. So it's a great technique depending on what you're doing for longer exposures, you know, maybe star trails, stuff like that. Really, it really depends on what you're doing. But suffice it to say, as long as you hold the shutter button down, the exposure will continue. We're not gonna jump into manual quite yet. I want to talk about program mode. So to get to program mode, we're going to switch our shutter speed dial to A. So our shutter speed is set to A, our lens is set to A. I'm gonna leave ISO where it is. P stands for program mode, and you'll notice that our shutter speed and our aperture are both white, which means the camera has control over those. If we were to take our hand and put them in front of the camera, you can see that they're both changing. The camera is trying to let more light in. Exposure compensation, when we change it, you'll also notice that both of those factors are changing. So when we go brighter or darker, the camera is, is shifting either of those. Program mode is great when you're just getting started. If you know setting your shutter speed and your aperture is overwhelming, it's a good place to, to start. I know pro wedding photographers who shoot in program mode, believe it or not, and some of them are very famous. So you might notice that we get the half circle icon on shutter speed, even though it's white, watch what happens when we rotate this. So program mode is allowing us to choose different combinations of shutter speed and aperture together. So we change one dial and both of them will change and you can kind of say, well, I need a sort of a faster shutter speed. Or maybe I want a longer shutter speed. I personally use program mode if I'm shooting an event with a strobe. So if I have a strobe unit or a flash unit on the camera and I'm you know, taking hundreds of pictures, typically it's on program mode. That is recognized as the handheld flash mode for most camera systems. It just makes it easier. You don't want to deal with very long shutter speeds like an aperture priority mode, for example, with a strobe. Now let's talk about manual mode. And the way to get there is we're going to flip our lens switch to the aperture icons. And we're going to rotate our shutter speed dial to T. And now you'll notice that all three of these settings are blue. And what this means is that we're going to rotate the rear, rear control wheel for our shutter speed. We can rotate the front control wheel for our ISO. And we can also rotate the aperture ring to change our aperture. In manual mode, we dictate the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. The camera is not giving us any help. I find manual very useful when I'm doing strobe work or if I have a very particular lighting setup that I want the camera to stay locked and I don't want it to change. A couple interesting things about manual mode is that when we rotate the exposure control wheel, nothing happens. But yet when we change one of the settings, the exposure compensation bar changes. What's happening here is that the exposure compensation bar doesn't change exposure compensation. This is a light meter and it is giving us an estimate or a prediction of how underexposed or how overexposed the image will be. 
So this should be getting brighter or darker, but it's not really. So what's going on here? There's a setting in the deep menu we need to check to make sure that it's on. Down here, of course, it, you should, everybody should know this because you're, you know, you're a pure beginner. Everybody needs to know to come into this setting right here. Exposure preview in manual mode. I've, I turned mine off earlier. I was doing some experiments. I'm going to turn this on. Tap the shutter button to jump back out. And now what should be happening is we should be getting our exposure preview in manual mode. As we rotate this left and right, as we rotate our ISO, change our ISO, as we change our aperture ring. And what this bar over here is now doing is it's giving us an exposure estimation. It's a light meter. It's, it's saying, oh, you're probably one stop underexposed or, oh, you're probably one stop overexposed. This is not dealing with changing our brightness. You're doing that with these control wheels. Now, there is a third way that we can allow the camera to change its settings, and that is with auto ISO. And I don't teach it in the other modes because I want to simplify which variables you are worried about when you're learning those modes. In certain situations, I would say like an MMA sporting event where you're in a dark situation and you have bright lights changing rapidly, you have fast action. In that kind of a situation, I would be doing something like I would dial in my shutter speed exactly. I would open up my aperture as wide as it would go. But because the lights are flashing on and off faster than I can change my camera settings, in those instances, I would probably want auto ISO and get some help from the camera. So how do we get to auto ISO? So ISO is controlled with the front control wheel, and I'm going to rotate this as high as it'll go, and then it kicks into these ISO A modes. This is where we get auto ISO control, and I'm gonna set it to this one 3200, because this will allow the camera to change the exposure based on ISO control. In manual mode, shutter speed won't change, aperture won't change, but when we rotate the exposure compensation wheel, now this becomes an exposure compensation bar again, and it does it by changing our ISO. And when I rotate it the other way, I'm maxed out at 3200. If I go down, it's let it, letting me get away with it. So to, the way to control the limits on your auto ISO is we're going to jump into the menu, third tab, and then second page on that third tab, and you'll see ISO auto setting. So we're in auto two, and we can come in and determine the max sensitivity. If we wanted to turn that up, we could. We could have the default sensitivity, and we can also designate the minimum shutter speed. So if we're at this you know, sporting event, we want it to be minimum, something like that. We're basically assigning a shutter speed that is the limit for the camera before it kicks in the ISO. I'm gonna tap my shutter button, and now you can see that I've changed my maximum ISO allowance and I can go with much brighter images. So that's just a quick introduction to auto ISO. It allows the camera to kick in ISO without your permission in order to help you out. And I do not recommend you use this unless you're like an indoor sporting event or you have a pretty good grasp of the camera and you're, and you're ready to start exploring that because it creates some confusion in terms of what the camera's doing. So we've talked about a ton of stuff each of the four modes, aperture priority, shutter priority, program, manual mode, how to set the camera to get into those modes, how to change your exposure settings in each of those modes, how to change your image brightness. We've talked about auto ISO. We've talked about the safe barriers of 1 60th, 1 500th. It's a lot of information, and it it's usually takes a couple viewings for it to sink in. Rewatch it as needed with your camera in hand. If you do that a couple times, you are well on your way to becoming a great photographer. Let me share a few thoughts with you on shooting in video mode in terms of your exposure settings. And this is how you're going to want to set it up. You will want your shutter speed to be twice your frame rate. So typically I'm shooting at 30 frames per second when I'm shooting for YouTube. If I was doing a documentary or a film, I'd be shooting at about 24 frames per second. These resolutions can be found in our camera's video mode settings. Let's see here. We can change them here or we can go into the deep menu to change them. But suffice it to say, you want to take your frames per second and double it. So in this case, 30 doubled is 60. I want my shutter speed to be doubled 
that frame rate. So if I'm shooting at even, let's say a higher frame rate, 120 frames per second, I would want to be at 240. Now, the reason we do this is something referred to as the 180 degree shutter rule, which allows the image to have a film like look. If you increase the shutter speed, there's a couple things that, that will happen. Number one is you will get choppy video. And I'm going to turn this up so you can see this other problem here. Shooting at very fast shutter speeds for video when you're using a relatively slower frame rate, it's going to make the video very choppy. We don't get this soft motion blur. But the second problem is, especially on this kind of a camera and other cameras as well, is that we start to get video banding. And this has more to do with the light that I'm using. I'm using an LED light, which flickers. They flicker at a rate that is equivalent to the electric grid. I have a video that discusses this. And typically, anytime you go over 1 20th of a second, you're going to see banding in flickering LED lights. So the resolution to this is to shoot at 1 20th or lower, but in this case, I'm at 1 60th. So just keep that in mind. We want to double our frame rate to find the shutter speed. The next thing we're going to do is pick an appropriate aperture. If you want a blurry background, you'd be at 2.8. If you want something a little bit more stop down, something you'll notice sometimes is, is that when you're in video and you rotate the control ring, your aperture will not change. So of course, as everybody knows, the way to do this is to push your front control wheel into the camera body, right? And you can see that I can toggle that half upper circle from my aperture to my ISO. And then I can rotate the control wheel and I can change my aperture this way. And then now back to ISO. We can also come into our set menu. But let me touch this, come down, and then we can change our aperture this way as well. It's one of these quirky things. After we've dialed in the aperture we want, then we're going to rotate the front control wheel and finalize by tweaking the ISO. Now, having said this, lighting is very important when we're doing video work, and I highly recommend investing in, into some good quality lights. I will show you the ones that I use in my recommendations if you have a less of a budget or more of a budget on the crash course. Critical to keep an eye on your mic levels. You do not want them peeking out and turning red. And there's a lot of information that we'll cover in the deep menu on the crash course where I talk about video settings, F-log, using an Atomos Ninja, you know, five or B, shooting, you know, how to shoot raw, stuff like that. There's a lot of information on the crash course, way too much to get into here. But those are some basic video exposure settings and recommendations. It's time to start talking about the focusing systems of our Fuji X-T5. And I think about this when I got started 20 years ago, the focusing systems today are far superior, galaxies beyond what they were when I learned. They are very complex, there's lots of settings, and it can be overwhelming to a pure beginner learning the focusing systems. But the way that I teach it breaks it down into three parts how, when, and where. So if you think of focusing in terms of the how, when, and where, this is going to be easy. The first way we focus, I've already demonstrated, is with a halfway shutter button depression. If we push and hold the shutter button halfway down, we can see that we get this green box, we get this light lighting up. We also get this AFS indicator in green. It's telling us the camera has focused. When we're ready to take the picture, we push the shutter button down all the way. So how do we focus? With a halfway shutter button depression. In addition to this, we also have this AF on button. So we push the AF on button with our thumb. This too engages the focusing system. So there's a second way. A third way we can focus is by using this touch monitor. We've got a little hand that says shot. So if we touch on the screen, it'll focus quickly and take a picture. If we change this to AF, we can touch on the screen and also focus. Three different ways to engage our auto focusing, but the one that I want you to start learning in the beginning is with the halfway shutter button depression here. Next, let's talk about the when the camera is focusing. On the front of the camera, there's a little dial that says S, C, and M. These are our camera's focusing modes. The focusing modes tell the camera whether or not to do a single focus or a continuous focus. So I'm going to get a focus lock 
and I'm holding it halfway down and I'm moving the camera, the focus plane will stay locked and fixed. Sometimes what will happen is you'll be shooting, you know, a subject, maybe it's a building or you'll get it in focus and you'll move the position of your subject to make it more aesthetically pleasing. This is referred to as recomposing. It doesn't really work well with very wide apertures, but 4.5, 5.0, all day long where you're, you're getting a focusing lock and you're recomposing, keeping the shutter button halfway down, pushing it down all the way when you're ready to take the picture. So that's AFS. It deals with a single focusing lock. Now what we're going to do is we're going to flip the switch over to AFC. AFC stands for continuous autofocus. When we get our halfway shutter button depression now, you'll notice that this icon here in the bottom has changed. And as we rotate the camera, the focusing will update depending on where our box is. And you can see it kind of flashing here. AFC is perfect for sports shooting. So birds in flight, wildlife, maybe your kids running around. When you engage the focusing systems, the camera will update the focus over and over and over again very quickly. It happens many times per second, you can't see it. So when you are shooting moving subjects, things like you know animals, birds in flight, kids who aren't cooperating, you're going to want to shoot on AFC. Now the third focusing mode, if we flip the switch over to M, now we are dealing with manual focus. Manual focus basically means that when we engage our focusing systems, nothing's going to happen. Instead, we get this meter bar on the bottom and we can control the depth of our focus by rotating our focus control ring on our lens. So manual focus is no autofocus. We have to dial it in manually. I'm gonna flip this back to AFS. So we've talked about the how, we've talked about the when, now we can talk about the where. This deals with the camera's focusing squares. Now the easiest way to move your focusing squares is either with the joystick, so we can point the joystick left, right, up, down. If we push it into the center, it'll jump right back into the center of the screen. You'll notice if we go to an edge, it goes to the other edge. The same if we go up or down. So the joystick is a very easy way to do this, and it also gives us some instructions that if we rotate the rear control wheel, we can change the size of our cluster. You'll notice that it's hard to see, there's a green frame around all of this. In this wide cluster, the camera is looking for an area of contrast. And it's kind of hard to see, but you'll see these little uh, green squares locking onto the target. You can identify them. This is very handy if you're shooting a single person and you want eye detection, for example, but wide focusing cluster is looking for an area of contrast close to the camera. If I push on the joystick, I can jump back into this changing mode where we can basically control the size of our cluster. Maybe, maybe if you're doing birds in flight, it'd be something more like this. Or maybe if you wanted to get more precise for sports shooting or macro photography, we can continue to make this a pretty small square, pretty precise with our focusing point. We're telling the camera, hey, focus right there on that one spot. Focus right there on that one spot. So anytime you wanna change your focusing cluster, just move the joystick and you can change the size of your square. Again, because we're dealing with a touch monitor, we can also do this directly while tapping on the screen. But the core of it is, again, how does the camera focus? Halfway shutter button depression, AF on, touch the screen. When does the camera focus? Autofocus single, once, autofocus continuous, many times, manual, not at all. We do it with the, the ring. How do we change our focusing clusters with the joystick? We can change the size. We can also use the monitor to touch exactly where we want to focus. And that is the how, the when, and the where of the focusing systems. This is something that's going to require some practice in terms of jumping between those modes and jumping between the squares, but that is the easiest way to tackle it. Let's talk about some of the other focusing tools and tips that I can share with you. Face detection, if you are a portrait photographer, is an absolute game changer. By default, it's going to be set up on this 
FN, I think it's FN1 button up here on just in front of the exposure compensation wheel. When you push this, you're going to see face on eye auto. You're going to toggle through a couple different options. Face detection turned off is typically what it'll be when you get the camera. And that first face on eye auto essentially tells the camera to look for a human face and to make its own decision between a left eye or a right eye focus. If we continue to push it down, face detection off. So this is toggling it on or off. Now the question you probably have is what if I wanted to you know, direct eye detection to a left eye or a right eye? We can jump into our Q menu and by default you should see it down here on the bottom. So as we rotate the rear control wheel, here we are turning it on. Here we are doing eye detection with auto eye. Here we are prioritizing the right eye. And if we go with this, tap the shutter button, you can see that the camera is more or less focused on the right eye of our subject as our subject is facing us. Now, the reason you want to use this when you're shooting portraits is it's going to increase the number of keepers you have. It's going to make it easier to get the shot. It's going to be a more faster, more enjoyable experience. It does require a certain amount of real estate. So if you back up far enough or your subject is, is too small, eventually it will give up and it'll you know shift over to another focusing type. But it is surprising how accurate and precise this is and really a game changer. So the idea of the Q menu is that you could you know come in here and dictate which type of eye detection you want, whether it's left, right, whether you want the camera to decide or just go with something like a plain face detection. In the case of face detection, you can see that eye detection is no longer engaged. And this also works with the focusing mode. So right now I'm in AFS. If I wanted to go with something like AFC, flip the switch over, and then it's going to be in a continuous autofocus mode. Something you should be aware of is the X-T5 also has animal face detection. So let's come in here and turn this off. Oh, and so by the way, the summary on this is that you can dictate the type of eye detection you want in the Q menu. And then when you come back out and you toggle it, it will jump to that type of a face or eye detection. So just real quick, let's just set this up. We'll go right eye detection. So when I push this face detection off, and now I have right eye priority. It's a really quick, easy way to customize it and get easy access to it. So let me show you a little bit about animal face detection. Animals are different. There's lots of different species of animals and it, this technology is not perfect, but it is getting better. So I have, I just so happen to have this picture of this lion over here in the corner. Let's see if the camera will notice it. Yep, there it is. So animal detection, what's, what's happening is the camera is trying to find the face of an animal. There's lots of different animals. Again, it, it, it's not perfect. So something I want to show is what happens when I come back to the human is we do not get eye detection because we're dealing with humans again. And if I engage eye detection, you'll notice that it tells us the subject detection is turned off. So what that means is animal detection is turned off when we are dealing with humans, face detection, eye detection, things of that nature. And if you were to come in here and, and try to turn that back on again, you can see that it's turning off. I won't go into these other subjects, but we have birds, cars, motorcycles, airplanes, even trains. Really cool to see the technology that's coming to help us focus our cameras better. But that is face and eye detection. Let's talk a little bit about manual focus. So I'm on autofocus single, I'm reaching to the front of the camera and I'm flipping the switch over to manual focus. You'll notice that as soon as I do this, I get this meter bar right above our exposure settings. And this is in meters, we can change it to feet, and you'll see a little white tick mark there, and that is indicating where our focus is as we rotate the focus ring on our lens. Now you'll notice that the camera jumped in when I started manual focus, and that's a feature called focus check. Focus check, I'm gonna turn that off to demonstrate some of these other tools. Focus check is pretty handy, but sometimes you, you don't always want to jump in when you're zooming. An easier way to kind of do this to decide whether you want to focus from further distances or jump in is to push the, the rear control wheel into the camera body. And you can see that we get this quick jump in. This is very effective when we, we start rotating 
the control wheel to the right. So we can get really, really close to our subject. Then we can rotate our focusing ring. And you can see that we get a precise focusing lock. I'm going to tap the shutter button and it's going to jump me out. I like to refer to this as manual zoom focusing. So when we're moving the square around and it's green, this isn't going to work. But once it's back in its white mode, we push it into the camera body and it jumps in. We can also zoom out if that's too close. This is something that should become second nature to you, especially if you do a lot of videography. And uh, you know, typically when you're shooting high-end video, focus is locked. Now, in addition to this, there are some other focusing tools I'm gonna talk about briefly in the deep menu. Auto focus, manual focus is the second page as we come down and you can see that it has these red boxes, right? We can customize our auto focus custom settings in here. It's a deep topic. I will cover it on the crash course. But as we can continue to come down, there are a couple things in here I want to point out. Store autofocus by orientation means is the camera will remember where your focusing square is when you alternate back and forth between holding the camera flat or in portrait orientation. So if you turn that on, it'll and it could also remember it by the cluster. So it'll remember the cluster or it'll remember the position of the point. Coming down here, there's a couple things in here I'm going to warn you about. Currently it's turned off pre-AF. I'm gonna flip the switch back over. This is something that I recommend leaving turned off. Pre-AF basically gives the camera permission to focus even when you are not focusing. It's like a pre-focus, drains your battery, it can interrupt focus when you engage it. There's just some little things about it that I don't like, so I'd recommend leaving it turned off. Coming down further, we have, again, some more of these redundant settings we've seen in other places. But this guy right here, Manual Focus Assist, I'm going to show you the one that I like. I don't really use the digital split image or the digital micro prism. Coming in to the peaking highlight, I'm going to select red high, tap the shutter button. We don't see it right now because we're in autofocus single. Flip it over to manual. And you can see that we get this red outline where we have areas of high contrast. So when I zoom out, you can see it more in the blinds edges. As I zoom in more and more, it's like, like I'm, <laughs> it's like my eyes are almost demonic, right? When I punch in to zoom in, it goes away. So peaking focus does not work when you are zoomed in. It works in manual focus, but it doesn't work in manual zoom focus. And we can also change the colors. So this is very useful when you're getting set up for video shooting. If you want to get a quick look to see where your depth of field is, you know, maybe, maybe you're shooting and you want to see your depth of field in the grass somewhere, come in here, pick the color. Depending on what you're shooting, here's yellow. And this will show you the area of greatest contrast, which almost always correlates to something that is in focus. And that is manual peaking focus. Come in here, turn this off. Focus check is something I typically leave turned off. It basically means that when you manually focus, it will punch in the zoom. So if I rotate the focusing wheel, you can see it punch in. I just think it's easier to do it from the rear control, control wheel, so I leave this turned off. Let's talk about focusing in the video mode. So I'm going to flip the switch over to movie mode. There are some things in here that can be really confusing the first time you jump into video mode. For example, if I'm trying to touch focus between the face and this target I have over here, the camera's not cooperating. So what's going on? When we come into the deep menu, third page, first tab, we see this video icon. Anytime you see this, this movie camera, it's talking about video. Video auto focus mode. And it has two of these guys in here that we haven't seen before. First one's called multi, and the second one is called area. Now how they are different is that the multi focusing cluster is going to find something of contrast that's close to you and focus on it. But because I'm in auto focus single right now, the focus will not change until I touch on the screen. And that's what's happening. In auto focus continuous, the camera is going to do this largely by itself. I'm not touching the screen, I'm just moving the camera back and forth, and it's picking a subject matter of high contrast that's close to the camera. So when we're in video shooting, that multi-focusing cluster is going to behave differently depending on which focusing mode we're in. And this can be very useful if you're talking in front of the camera and then you're holding a product up in front of you and you want the camera to focus on it. Let's say you don't have anybody helping you. It has a time and place. 
Most of the time, however, when I am doing video shooting, I am in the area mode. And the area mode behaves similarly to what we saw in the focusing for stills. So I can move this joystick around. I get a focusing square. I can change the size of it. To me, this is a little bit more straightforward if you don't have the knowledge about what's happening in the multi-mode. In addition to that, we can use the AF focusing where we can direct the focusing square precisely by touching on the monitor. And I'll, I'll give more demonstrations with this when we get into the crash course. I'll demonstrate the different kinds of video shooting styles from you know vlogging to narrative work, interviews, documentaries. And I, I show you the differences of focusing between each of those, but this is a very powerful technique if you're shooting and you want to direct the viewer's attention from one subject matter to another. Something I have to point out is that this touch focus operates differently as well, depending on what mode you're in. In autofocus, so I'm going to flip the switch to autofocus single, what, what it'll do is it'll get a focus lock and it'll stay there until I change the focusing square or if I turn this guy off. So every time we engage it, you can see this green box with the AF that means focus is locked in AF single. If I flip the switch to autofocus continuous, then the camera will refocus over and over and over again as long as that box is over a subject that it can detect. And you'll notice that it's not allowing me to change with the joystick. I have to do it with the touch screen or I can turn it off and then I can come in and use the joystick again. The X-T5 is very powerful in regards to focusing tools, but that should be a good start. And additionally, when I'm shooting video, a lot of times I'll just go into manual mode and I'll do that same zoom focus technique where I'm, I can move the box over here, push into the camera body, and then we have that quick focus check ability. In the beginning, it's going to feel a little weird, but with muscle memory, this will get easier and faster. But there's no way as a beginner you can know these things without you know, like studying the manual for hours. So those are some great tools to get started with focusing, both in stills and video, the differences between the modes and how those tools work in different modes. We will be demonstrating how to use these focusing tools in real world shooting situations on the crash course. A couple other little things I wanna point out is that in our deep menu on the second page, we have the autofocus manual focus. On the first tab of this, we have this thing that says autofocusing mode. I definitely recommend leaving this on all, and you can see all of our clusters in here, but this is not the place where we select them. This is the place where we designate what will be available to us using the joystick in rear control wheel. So you wanna leave this on all. I also want to point out this guy right here, it says wide slash tracking. What that means is that when we select the full frame, depending on what mode we're in, so this is for autofocus single, That'll give us the wide frame. So I want to leave this turned to all, definitely. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to change my focusing clusters this way. And you can see I can go from a single point all the way up to the zones and wide. So now we're on wide. And with our focusing target, it's kind of funny. But the camera's looking for an area of contrast. And it's focusing on the blinds over here just on the left. This is one of the problems when, when we're dealing with subject matters that might not have a contrasty background is it can confuse the camera. You know, I think it's pretty easy. Hey, camera focus right here, right? It's not happening. It's missing it. But now let me show you what happens when I flip to autofocus continuous. Now we have a focusing square. And when I engage the focusing, watch that green box as I am panning to the left and right. So What's happening is the camera is tracking the subject as I'm shooting. And if I was to take pictures and move, the camera is tracking and updating that tracking and focusing as the pictures are happening. It's a very powerful tool when we are doing any kinds of sport shooting and there's places in the deep menu to customize this. In the beginning, I would say do not mess with the customizations, leave it on the multi-purpose. As you get more and more use in your particular type of sport, you are going to probably come in here and tweak this a little bit. I just don't recommend it for beginners. I talk about this more in the deep menu section of the crash course, and that is tracking in the wide mode. Let's talk about changing our white balance. And by default, pushing right on the directional pad in a shooting mode
is going to pull up our white balance. There's a short answer to this and there's some longer answers to this. The short answer is if you're first getting started, shoot on auto ISO. And you can do even a white priority and you'll notice you have this triangle that you can push further to the right and you get this crazy grid. Stay away from this. This is white balance shift. In my whole career, I think I've used this maybe a couple times in weird lighting situations. Auto white balance gives the camera permission to change the color of the light as it's being recorded. Now our eyeballs are very sophisticated. When we go from an indoor lighting situ situation to outdoors, we don't really notice this change because our eyes adjust so quickly. Camera sensors can't, cannot do this. So we even have this auto white priority, come down, we go to the right, we have this grid, which is our white balance shift. If you're a pure beginner, don't mess with this. But let's go through each of these real quick and talk about when you would change these. What will happen is that as an intermediate photographer, you're going to, you're going to come to a situation where the color of your images start to look a little bit off, even in auto white balance. The whole idea of, of white balance is to dial in the icon with what you're shooting in. Now these first three are custom white balance. We'll come back to these. Then we get our Kelvin white balance. Again, we'll talk about that in a second. And then we come to these icons. So daylight balance. If we were shooting in the sun, we would want on the sun icon. If we were shooting in the shade after clouds, we would change it to the cloud icon. Then we get these different types of fluorescent lighting. Then we get incandescent light, which is a light bulb, and you can see that it's turning it really blue. And then we have underwater white balance, which is not a lot of camera companies have an underwater white balance. So if you get a housing, you can shoot with this underwater. And you'll notice that the tone or the color is changing on each of these, slightly different on all of them. So that's basically an intermediate understanding is you're going to change the icon to the situation you're shooting in. So let's take this a step further. Let's say you're shooting in mixed lighting conditions where you have maybe an incandescent and a fluorescent lamp together. In cases like that, or if you're doing a lot of video work, you should definitely become familiar with the custom white balance tool. So in this instance, when we push to the right, we don't get that white balance shift in bracket grid, we get this. And what the camera is asking is to take a picture using the shutter to capture the new white balance. It says it's completed. We're going to hit set to OK. And now we have told the camera that this, what you're seeing, is white. I used to do this all the time with bride's dresses. Sometimes I'll do it with white walls, maybe a sheet of paper if I needed to get a custom white balance shooting in mixed lighting conditions more common with videographers because they have to get it right in camera. But you can see that we have this nice even tone. Mixed lighting conditions, you're going to go with a custom white balance if it's not changing. Pushing to the right again, this is a much longer answer so I can explain what is going on with all these weird settings. Kelvin is a scientific temperature rating given to the different colors of light based on their origin. Suffice it to say that scientists have figured out a way to measure light sources in this number. And the most important one you should know about is 5100, which is about what daylight is. So I'm using daylight bulbs. I know the bulbs are pretty close to this Kelvin temperature. So when you know your light source, oftentimes you can just come in and set your Kelvin temperature and you'll be good to go. But let's take this a step further, and I want to show you something interesting that happens as I turn the Kelvin temperature down, is the color of it becomes very, very blue. An example of a lower Kelvin temperature light would be like candlelight, 2600. Candlelight is orange, but what we're seeing on the camera is blue. So what's happening here is the camera is adding the opposite color of the light source. So if we're shooting in very, very orange light and we dial that the Kelvin temperature is this orange Kelvin temperature is 2600, 2500, the camera offsets it and it should make it more neutral as it's being recorded. If we go in the opposite direction, certain fluorescent lights, you know, 34, 3600. But let's say we deal with very, very hot temperatures, turning this up to 9,500, you can see that it's orange. I like to think of this in terms of blow torches. Blow torch is blue, it's very hot. 
And so if we were in a room full of blue blow, blow torches, the camera would add orange light to balance it out. So that's the longer answer is that when we set our color temperature, what we're really doing is telling the camera to add the opposite color of the light source we're shooting in in order to get a neutral look. Again, I know these lights are 5100. When we hit OK, we can do the white balance shift and bracket. And if we're OK with that, hit OK. So that is your white balance. The short answer is if you're just getting started, keep it on auto white balance. As you become more experienced, start changing it to these icons. If you're dealing with mixed lighting condition, set your custom white balance. And if you're doing high-end videography and you know the color of the lights you're shooting in, you can dial it in with Kelvin. You know it's a lot of information. Let's talk about changing our drive modes, which is done by rotating this lever on, underneath this knob on the left side. This is really important because it tells the camera what to do after we push the shutter button down all the way. It controls the drive operation of the camera. Some of the more common ones, S is a single shot. So if I push and hold it down, it takes one image. If I go to a continuous low or a continuous high, now we are dealing with a burst mode. Listen. As long as I hold the shutter button down in those modes, the camera is going to be taking multiple images. This is very useful when we are shooting sports. Now we have some other items on here that we're not really sure what they mean. ADV, BKT, HDR, all these things. On the far end over here, we have a panoramic mode. And this is something I love about Fuji cameras is because if I don't have a wide angle lens, Panorama mode will sometimes allow me to get through that. And it works similarly to is how you would do it on a smartphone. It tells you which direction to go, and we can change that direction by pushing to the right. We can go from left to right. We can go from bottom to top, top to bottom, or right to left, or hit OK. We can change the angle in terms of a medium or a large panorama. And the idea on this is that we are going to push and hold and sweep as we're going. And what will happen is the camera will stitch those together. See, I interrupted it. We'll do this at a beach on the crash course. I'll demonstrate some of the different techniques in terms of how to use it. It's a really fun tool. But some of you are already asking, how can we control you know, number of frames per second, for example, or these other settings? And this is the thing that no beginner is going to know this on Fuji cameras. How can, how can they expect you to know this stuff? They can't. So in order to control these things, you have to come into your deep menu, third tab, where we have our shooting setting. On the first page here, it is the drive setting. So this guy right here allows us to control how our drive mode dial works. There's no way you would know that. If I push to the right, now we have access to all of these settings. For example, our continuous high burst right here, I can come in to 15 frames per second mechanical or continuous shooting speed of 13 frames per second with electronic shutter. But you're looking up at here and you're, you're like, hey, I, I thought this is capable of 20 frames per second in a crop mode. It is. But you'll notice it has this little ES after it. ES stands for electronic shutter. So again, how do you know how to do that? Well, we got to come back out, come down to shutter type and select electronic shutter. We can select this. Now we come back up to our drive setting, come down to continuous. And now we have access to these higher burst modes that actually shoot in at about a 1.3 crop. So if you're trying to get those maximum frames per second, you're going to have to shoot in electronic shutter mode. And we have 20, 13, and 10. Whatever you set it to here will be reflected by the dial here. I, I kind of like 15 frames per second mechanical. Electronic shutter usually is fine, but it depends on the, what you're shooting in, the light you're shooting in, and sometimes you'll get you know jello effect or you'll get lighting artifacts. It just really depends. But hey, there's a time and place for it. I just typically prefer mechanical shutter. I've never outshot my shutter. It's never broke. Coming back up to the drive setting, we can also control the lower speed burst between three, five, and seven frames per second. 
And then we have these other settings. So BKT stands for bracketing. Bracketing means that we're giving the camera permission to change certain settings between each shot. In, in the Fuji cameras, it gets very specific. For example, we can change our auto exposure. So we take a darker, an even, and a brighter image. We can do it by ISO bracketing. We can do it by film simulation bracketing, white balance bracketing, dynamic range bracketing, on the crash course, we'll demonstrate focus bracketing. So the camera's changing the position of the focusing as you're shooting, for example, product image. You know, if you wanted to get something with a very deep depth of field and very sharp, most of these I'll demonstrate. But the idea is that bracketing, we select which one we want to change and the camera will change those settings from shot to shot. Auto exposure bracketing is typically the most common, but once we have set this up and we've selected the one we want, we could come in and dial in specific settings for each of those brackets, if it's, if it's a possibility, right? So we can control how many frames do we want? How much difference do we want between each of them? Let's see here. It's a lot to go into, but this is how you would set up each of those. And again, we'll talk about these more on the crash course. HDR mode stands for high dynamic range. And this is great when you are shooting in a very dynamic lighting situation where you have lots of bright lights, lots of, lots of shadows, and you're trying to get it all in one image. In the past, we would, we would shoot with exposure bracketing and then take those images and bring them into Photoshop and merge them together. If you don't have time for that, sometimes HDR is great, and I'll demonstrate this on the crash course. This guy here, advanced filter setting, these are not professional tools, but they're kind of fun if you want to play with them. You can come in here and select which one you want. They're like little filter effects, and that is accessed when we rotate this to advanced. So depending on which one you want to see, you can come in here and change those in the advanced filter settings. Get a little bit of a preview, but that is the advanced filter setting. Again, we can access our HDR right here on the end. Most of the time you're going to be shooting on S or continuous high. And that is our drive modes. Let's talk about our metering mode. And Fuji will also call this by photometry, but the metering mode by default can be accessed by pushing up on your directional pad, you know, unless you've customized this in some other way. The easiest way for me to explain how this works is to set this to spot metering mode. And we're also going to make sure that our camera is in aperture priority mode. So this dial up here is set to A. I've dialed in my, the aperture that I want. Got an ISO for the lighting situation that I'm in. So if you remember correctly, when we were talking about, you know, changing the amount of light that, that's coming into the camera and the camera would make adjustments, this is how the camera does it. It's with photometry or with the metering mode. I have currently set up to be in spot metering mode and I've put a lamp on a tripod over here. So watch what happens to the shutter speed as I move my focusing square over this very bright light. Okay, everything changes, it's darker. Now it's recommending a shutter speed of 1 800th of a second. And as I move that away from the bright light, you can see that it's using a longer and a longer shutter speed. So what's happening in the spot metering mode is we're telling the camera to sample light coming in to our focusing square and to make adjustments to the camera based on that light. If we were to change the size of our focusing square, it even works when we get really small. Tap shutter button, now it's saying one eight thousandth of a second. So it's measuring the light coming into that area and giving a recommendation based on the amount of that light. We move it over to these blinds, they're not as bright. Okay, now we have a longer shutter speed. One three hundred and twentieth, come back over here. 1 8,000th of a second. So with that in mind, there are some other shapes and patterns that the camera will use. If I push up on, oh, it's flickering because it's, it's a little, it's probably confused by the LEDs or something. Let's see if we can get it to stop. Multi, okay. Coming back down to center weighted, just like it sounds, it weighs the center more importantly than the periphery. Easier to see if we zoom in, you can see the shutter speed changing. It's getting faster because it's sampling in a larger area. If we turn it off to the side, now it's going to get brighter. 
So we don't see an outline of the center weighted, but just suffice it to say, it's right here in the middle. Really good for using when you're shooting into heavy backlight, for example, if the portrait, you have light coming into the corners, it'll, it'll measure in the middle more so. We can come down to an average metering mode where it, it, it takes a look at the entire frame and it tries to average everything out. And the most common one, the one you should probably leave it on when you're just getting started is the multi-metering mode, which breaks the frame up into different patterns and it gives different priority depending on what that pattern is seeing. It's kind of like a general purpose one. The two that I really use more than anything are the multi-metering mode and the spot metering mode occasionally, but most of the time, yeah, I'm on multi-metering mode. And that is metering modes or photometry. Let me give you some gear and lens recommendations. This is your first camera. You probably don't have a tripod yet. It's probably the best first piece of gear that you should get. Your tripod is going to allow you to put your camera in places that where you don't have to hold it, especially if you're in front of the camera or if you're doing anything with video work, uh, landscape photography, long exposures, tripods have a multitude of uses and purposes. I personally prefer the carbon fiber legs. They're more expensive and the nice ones can run as much as four or $500. But Bogan Manfrotto and some other manufacturers make some decent aluminum travel ones that you could probably get less than 200. It's important to invest into your tripod. You don't want to go and buy that Walmart tripod for $50 because they will break over time. If you had to do it and you had nothing else, Sure, but a tripod is an investment you're going to want to last for you know five to ten years, and that's why I like the carbon fiber Bogan Monfrados. At some point, you are going to need to get yourself a set of filters, especially if you are a landscape photographer, if you do video work, if you're doing a lot of strobe work for portraits, or you want to get creative with long exposures. You will need a set of ND filters, and especially for landscape photographers, you'll need a polarizer. I can make a great recommendation, and that is of the Maven magnetic filter line. We also have a threaded line called the Maven High Standard. Either of those are available in the link in my descriptions. You can get a whole set of Maven filters for a very affordable price, and they have a lifetime warranty. In my opinion, they are the best out there. Now, if you get into video work, you're going to need to invest into a microphone because the microphone on the camera doesn't really work that great. As you're handling the camera, as you're changing the zoom, you're going to hear it in the camera. It, it just picks up a lot of the noise and vibrations. It's not a really high quality one. There are two different microphones that I recommend. If you're just getting started and you need a general purpose microphone, I would say get the Maven mic. And that's sold on our website as well as Amazon. We put that through a battery of tests and it was the winner among the most popular brands when we were designing it. It's affordable, it's like 50 bucks. Many of you will be tempted to go out and buy the Rode microphone. It's a $300 microphone and probably a little bit more than what you need for a general purpose mic. If you are doing on-camera work like this, I would strongly recommend a lavalier mic. And I'm wearing Countryman. It's kind of expensive, but it's a really good mic. And then you'll need a transmitter and a receiver pack. In the past, I typically stuck with the Sennheiser E100 series. Very reliable, very high quality audio. But I have also recently tried the new DJI mic. It is a really incredible pack. It allows you to record two voices into the same transmitter. Really nice microphone set. I also highly recommend that if you're looking for a lab set, very affordable. You basically have a backup or you can do two people at once. Really awesome. Let me give you some lens recommendations for your Fuji X-T5. In the beginning, the kit lens, the 18 to 55 with the variable 2.8 to f4 aperture, it's a, it's a home run value. You can go to eBay and find those all day long for less than $200 and it's a fantastic starter lens. It's light, it's portable. Yes, there's a new 16 to 80 kit lens. That's expensive, it's like $800. So I usually typically recommend new students to get that 18 to 55. If you start doing high-end video work, you're going to want to get the 2.8s, the 16 to 50 2.8. It's an amazing lens, it's sharp, but the 16 to 55 on a gimbal for video work is chef's kiss, man. It is awesome and it is the workhorse that stays on my Fujis. The wide angle lens suggestion that I'm recommending is the Fuji 10 to 24 F4. I've done some reviews on it. I love it, I use it. It's a great wide angle lens if you're just getting started. The two other zoom lenses I strongly recommend for Fuji are the 50 to 140. It's a mid-range telephoto zoom. You'd use it for things like portraits or if you're close in sports. 
in an incredible lens that Fuji has is the 100 to 400, an absolute home run of a lens. We took it on Safari in Africa. It was astonishingly good in terms of sharpness, accuracy. It's very lightweight. Those are the zooms I recommend. Now, having said that, Fuji has a ton of prime lenses and they're all incredible and sharp. It really depends on the focal length you're going for. I recommend prime lenses after you figure out what kind of photography you're going to be doing in getting a specialist lens. That's really what they're for. If you're just starting, I would say stick with the zooms for now. In any event, thank you so much for joining me on this tutorial of your Fuji X-T5. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.